You're up, Chris. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Gary. And can you uh, just confirm that you can see my slides and hear me okay? Yep. yep. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Gary, for inviting me to, to give this talk. And thanks to everyone who's uh, taken some time out of their day to, to come and listen. I appreciate your, your attention. And I'll try to uh, regale you with um, a possible new way of uh, addressing the challenges that are Georgia's bank yellowtail flounder. So I thought I'd start with what, what was the reasoning behind uh, this new approach? And basically, it came down to that recently, um, Georgia's bank yellowtail flounder has been at very low abundance. And with, associated with that, there have been low quotas. Despite these low quotas, catch has been well below uh, these low quotas. And in some years, discards have been greater than landings. Um, the current approach that, or the recent approach that has been used to manage um, in Georgia's bank yellowtail flounder is an empirical approach that basically tracks the surveys. As the surveys go up, the cat quota goes up. As the surveys go down, the quotas go down. However, at these low abundance uh, levels that we're currently seeing, a question arose about whether we were actually tracking a signal in the population or just noise in our survey observations. And there was a question raised uh, during the 2020 assessment about whether we could uh, have a simpler approach to, to managing the stock. So with that as the, the motivation, uh, I thought I'd just lay out where, I, where I'd like to go during the talk today. I'm gonna start with a quick uh, history review and then talk uh, or show you some of the, the signals that we're currently seeing within this uh, population and fishery. Then talk about the empirical approach that has been used uh, recently to manage the fishery. And then the bulk of uh, my presentation will be on the limiter itself, what it is and how it might be used as a new way for managing this uh, stock. And finally, at the end, I uh, just want to cap off with some lessons learned throughout this process. So to start with the history review, um, this is actually a slide from a talk I gave back in 2006 um, that showed all the different people who've uh, been involved in the assessment of Georgia's Bank Yellowtail Flounder over the years. Um, the two people who are pictured and bolded in, uh, back in the 1950s and 60s are Royce and Lux, uh, the, the real um, progenitors of uh, yellowtail flounder biology and fishery stock assessment. But if you look through the names, you'll see uh, a lot of familiar ones, uh, people who have been involved in this stock. Uh, assessment over the years. And so I'm stand, certainly standing on the shoulders of giants uh, as I uh, took over in the early 2000s uh, for the stock assessment. Along the way, there have been some uh, memorable events. Uh, some of these were before I started uh, in time as the lead for the Georgia's Bank Yellowtail Flounder Stock Assessment. Um, Probably the most notable was in 1984, the Hague Line, which separates US and Canada international waters, uh, was declared uh, through international court. And you can see it cuts the Northeast Peak uh, off of Georgia's bank and declares that as Canadian waters. And then uh, to the West are the US waters. If you were able to attend last week's uh, uh, seminar, uh, you heard uh, Steve Cadron talk about the uh, mid-90s collapse of cod, haddock, and yellowtail. Uh, that led to some major management changes, and in 1995, closed area two was made a year-round closed area. It had been a seasonal closed area prior to that, but it became year-round in 1995. Uh, the 1998 and 2000 TRAC and TMGC are joint uh, US-Canada uh, scientific TRAC and management TMGC bodies. 
that were formed to address um, uh, the assessment and management of cod, haddock, and yellowtail on Georgia's bank. Uh, through a lot of hard work, uh, by 2002, it uh, was declared a success. The spawning stock biomass was the highest it had been since 1973, and the fishing mortality rate was below the reference uh, fishing mortality rate. However, there were worrying signs even then, and by 2004, um, the stock had tipped back over and was in both overfished and overfishing conditions. Uh, I highlight the 2002 and 2004 um, because uh, Heath Stone, a Canadian uh, colleague, um, led a paper that I participated on uh, called The Collapse and Recovery of the Yellowtail Flounder Fishery on Georgia's Bank. Uh, we submitted it in 2002 when that success was uh, fresh in our mind, um, but due to the joys of uh, publishing, by the time it actually appeared in print in 2004, it did not seem like such an appropriate publication uh, to have uh, made. To come back to the track and TMGC, um, it's a a little more complex than a lot of the uh, management processes that uh, we're used to in this region, where we have the, the New England Fishery Management Council um, being informed by our, this, its uh, scientific and statistic, or statistical, scientific and statistical committee. Uh, the track, as I mentioned, is made up of scientists from both the US and Canada, and it provides uh, a, a recommendation uh, to the Transboundary Management Guidance Committee, the um, joint US-Canada um, uh, management group. But it also provides its results to the uh, New England SSC, which then provides um, uh, ABC recommendation to the New England Fishery Management Council. Uh, unlike the track, the SSC uh, is a limiting um, recommendation in that the council cannot set a quota greater than the ABC that the SSC uh, sets. And so the TMGC actually is a negotiating body between Canada and US that negotiates the quota of Eastern Georgia's Bank Cod, Eastern Georgia's Bank Haddock, and Georgia's Bank Yellowtail Flounder. And so this has made for some challenges uh, to the management when uh, either the SSC has set the uh, ABC before the negotiations occur and thus the uh, negotiating power of the US uh, contingent to the TMGC is a bit limited or if the SSC uh, declares the ABC after the negotiations have already occurred, in which case uh, that may require further negotiation if uh, the SSC uh, ABC does not align with the negotiated value coming out of the TMGC. So it's a little more complex than some of our uh, groundfish fisheries in, in the region. Uh, some more going back to the, the history line. In 2005, there was a benchmark, and this began the era of the split series in the virtual population analysis, which was the assessment model used to assess this stock for many years. And split series is exactly that. It um, splits, instead of treating the survey series, uh, as beginning in 73 and going up until the terminal year of the assessment, it breaks it into two parts. And this allows the model more flexibility to better fit the recent observations, but has some uh, implications for what happened uh, during that uh, transition from one time period of the sur for its survey to another, when we don't think there was any actual change in the survey itself. In 2008 and 2009, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the Canadian uh, scientific body, had on their survey uh, individual deck toes of yellowtail flounder 
Uh, this in 2008, it was just over seven metric tons of yellowtail flounder in a single tow. Uh, the result of this single tow on the uh, stratified mean is shown in the top right figure where the, you see the time series in blue uh, going along. And then there's a red dot very high up, which is the stratified mean when you include uh, that individual tow uh, and compared with the green triangle, which is the value if you exclude that individual tow. This obviously caused some consternation, especially when in 2009, there was another individual tow, just over five metric tons of yellowtail flounder. Um, we haven't seen uh, any catches anywhere near these, these sizes, either previously or since then, but those two individual toes caused uh, quite a bit of um, head scratching and challenges for the assessment for a number of years. In 2009, our survey converted to the Bigelow. Uh, in 2013, we had a Georgia's Bank Yellowtail survey that went out on the US side of uh, Georgia's Bank and basically looked for yellowtail flounder and confirmed that yes, indeed, there's still yellowtail flounder out there um, but it also showed that the size distribution found in these higher density areas was nearly identical to the size distribution that was being estimated through our um, uh, NEFSC and DFO surveys that cover the entire bank in a stratified random sampling approach. So it disproved the hypothesis that the closed areas were acting as a refuge for some big old fish that were just not being seen by the survey and were unavailable to the fishery. Um, and this was borne out with some other uh, tagging work done that showed that there's high rate of movement of yellowtail around the bank. Um, and so even though they can form higher densities there, it's not a refuge because they don't stay uh, necessarily in that location. In 2014, there was the empirical benchmark when the virtual population analysis was uh, abandoned and replaced with the so-called empirical approach, which I'll describe a little bit later. And then finally in 2020, the limiter uh, was created. Throughout the uh, history of the stock assessment uh, using virtual population analysis, we've had uh, challenges associated with uh, very strong retrospective patterns. And so you can see as far back as 2003 in the far left, there was a retrospective pattern in the spawning stock biomass that showed that as you peeled off years of data the uh, estimates of spawning stock biomass were much higher than what you had with the full time series of data available at the time. The two middle plots show what happened when we split the series, which is the top panel, showing that there's not an, an indication of a strong retrospective pattern. Those black lines of peeled data are relatively close to the, the blue line of the full years of data. And you compare that with the, the exact same data, but now treating the surveys as a continuous time series uh, throughout the 73 to 2009 time period. And you see the very strong retrospective pattern uh, again there. However, by 2013, even the split series was no longer able to um, address whatever is driving the uh, retrospective pattern within the yellow, Georgia's Bank Yellowtail Flounder Assessment. And so you can see in the top right, um, we have just as strong uh, a retrospective pattern in 2013 with the split series model as we'd seen previously with the single series models. The uh, uh, picture down in the bottom right is uh, my son's interpretation of what a retro yellowtail would look like. And that brought a little levity to this very challenging uh, situation uh, as we are trying to address uh, 
these retrospective patterns uh, through many, many assessments. Moving on to what's happening currently, as I mentioned at the start of the talk with the motivation, um, recent catch has been well below the quota. Um, we've had years where discards uh, exceed the landings and we've clearly had low survey abundance. We've also have not seen any incoming recruitment, which explains how we can still see a lack of rebuilding uh, despite these very low catches. So this is a figure, uh, a slide taken from the, uh, this year's uh, track assessment in July. Uh, in the bottom left is the catch time series starting in 1935 when otter trawls started venturing out onto George's Bank and catching uh, yellowtail flounder essentially for the first time. And you can see the period in the late 60s, early 70s, where over 15,000 metric tons were taken uh, consistently from this stock. Uh, you can see the large decline down to uh, 1995, 1994, when the stock was uh, collapsed, and then a quick rebuilding when the strong management measures were put into place. However, that didn't, didn't last long, and you can see in recent years, it's hard to distinguish the uh, catch from the x-axis. And so in the right hand panel, you can see a blow up of the catch since 2004 and the black line is the quota. And you can see that with the exception of one year, which is simply a calendar year versus fishing year issue, um, in the terms of fishing year, every year uh, the catch has been less than the quota. Um, and in recent years, even though we've zoomed in on a much uh, smaller range of catch, we can still barely distinguish the catch from the x-axis uh, in the most recent years. And so that's what the table on the top is. And note that these values are now being reported in kilograms instead of metric tons, um, because when you round them to um, metric tons, you see uh, some strange addition where things apparently don't add up correctly. Um, but the take home point here is that discards were 63% of the landings in 2020. And the 2020 catch was the second lowest in the 86 year uh, time series. Uh, the only lower catch was in 2019. So normally one would expect with such low catches to see a rapid rise in the surveys as the fishing pressure uh, is released from the stock. And uh, this is what exactly what we did see back in the mid nineties when those strong management measures were put in place, we saw a rapid increase in the population. That's not happened uh, so far in um, recent years for the stock. And so the 2021 DFO survey in the top is the third lowest in 35 years. The NIMPS spring survey in 2021 was the sixth lowest in 54 years. And as you see by the missing dot there for the NIMPS spring in 2020 and in the bottom panel, um, COVID-19 prevented us from conducting our surveys our center surveys in 2020. But clearly there's uh, no indication of rapid rebuilding uh, of this uh, stock. And as I mentioned, the reason for this is that we've not had any uh, recruitment. And so what's shown here on the left columns are age one in our surveys. And because these can be uh, a bit noisy, uh, it's also shown as age two, where we do consistently catch um, fish. And what you can see is that in recent years, there are zero indication of um, any recruitment with the exception of nymph spring uh, age one in the bottom left, 
where 2019 had a um, what looked like something that was large for recent years, um, but um, we'll have to see because we didn't uh, conduct the 2020. We can't. We don't have an observation for it at age two, um, so we'll have to see in 2020. Uh, one, uh, whether it does or does not uh, show up. So moving on to the empirical approach, the uh, 2014 benchmark uh, wanted to look at a way to address all these uh, problems that the analytical model, the virtual population analysis had been having. And after uh, looking at a large number of uh, different approaches, the ag an agreement was made to uh, use an approach that is very simple in concept, that as the survey uh, increases, will allow more catch, and as the survey decreases, will um, reduce the catch. And what we did to make this um, operational was at the time used some literature values to uh, estimate the catchability that allowed us to expand the surveys from a stratified mean value up to an actual biomass amount. So we did this for each of the three surveys um, because we typically assess um, Georgia's bank yellowtail flounder in the summer, in June or July. Um, we decided to use the DFO, uh, the, the NIMPS spring, uh, the DFO, which happens just prior to it early in the year, and the previous fall uh, survey. So we have the most recent information from all three surveys, and then apply an exploitation rate. And in the um, benchmark, we looked at a large number of scenarios to uh, consider what might be an appropriate exploitation rate given uh, the other information that we had available to us. Um, and so uh, from starting in 2014, this empirical approach uh, was used. Uh, then by 2020, we started encountering the issue of the missing surveys. So in 2020, we had the spring uh, center survey was not available because of COVID-19. But thankfully at the time, uh, in general, the spring survey tends to be sort of between the DFO and the fall survey. And so missing that one survey didn't have a big impact on the empirical approach. And so we were able to carry on um, without having to make any adjustments when we got to the 2021 assessment though, the, the fall survey missing from 2020 did become a problem because as I mentioned, the fall survey tended to be higher. And so by not, in, not having it available, that created an artificially low uh, S survey estimate. And so the um, uh, track had to figure out a way to adjust for this uh, missing survey. In the 2021 assessment, we also had a uh, new survey catchability. Um, these uh, were derived from uh, uh, experiments conducted locally, and they had been used for a number of years. Um, but the Tim uh, Miller and others uh, had developed a new process to estimate a more appropriate catchability. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, we had new survey catchabilities that we had to address. <clears throat> so in terms of the empirical approach, this exploitation rate has consistently been the most contentious part of the um, approach. As I mentioned earlier, it was based on a number of scenarios, but um, in 2000, uh, I forget the, the year, um, when we switched over to the empir original empirical, uh, original experimental su uh, survey catchabilities, we then had to adjust the exploitation rate 
And that led to much discussion about whether to use a quota or catch to define the exploitation rate and which time period uh, to use as the exploitation rate. And these discussions have continued every year since. And this is because there have been uh, some apparently large uh, exploitation rates associated with the quota, um, for example, in the lines that start, has the assessment year 2017, um, shows a 32% uh, uh, exploitation rate associated with the quota um, that was not felt to be appropriate given that we'd seen a 95% decline in the um, bi survey biomass over the period uh, of the empirical approach. So um, these discussions uh, have occurred every year in this past year. Uh, we, we had been using 6% uh, as the exploitation rate based on the average of the 2010 to 2017 quotas. Um, and when we used the new Miller et al values, 7% now became the new uh, exploitation rate based on the average of those years. And this is because the um, new uh, survey catchabilities were slightly uh, lower, causing uh, lower expanded biomass, which means a higher exploitation rate. So in terms of the empirical approach, uh, the pros are that it's, it's simple, it's algorithmic. You, there aren't uh, subjective decisions with the one exception. Um, and the catch advice responds directly to survey changes. So that if the survey were to suddenly indicate a large increase in abundance, we would uh, be able to respond appropriately. Conversely, if the con surveys continued to decline, uh, the quotas would uh, also decline. In terms of cons, this is the exploitation rate discussions um, that have been very challenging to have uh, year after year. It also had the problems of dealing with the missing surveys um, due to COVID and the question of whether we are, the, the survey noise is outweighing any possible signal uh, that is occurring in the population. And I've included a picture of a sea scallop here to remind me to tell you that although clearly these uh, very low catches and quotas are not allowing a directed fishery for yellowtail flounder on George's bank, uh, the, these quota discussions are still very important because of their potential to limit the very valuable sea scallop fishery that operates in the same region and whose habitat is essentially identical to that of yellowtail flounder in, on George's bank. So in terms of the, the limiter, um, in 2020, after having yet another one of these discussions about the empirical rate and whether the, the surveys were really tracking um, the population or not, and the idea was brought up of maybe we should just pick a constant catch advice and hold that unless there was a significant change uh, either up or down um, in the surveys. And some ideas were thrown around about how that might happen. And one was to use recent history of the average survey biomass. So what we've, what we've seen recently and so uh, during the meeting one night, I uh, developed in our Shiny app that would allow everyone to sort of look at this on their own and come up with their own ideas and then be able to bring them back to the, the table. And so this was version one in 2020 of the track Georgia's Bank Yellowtail Limiter. It's as for those of you who've seen uh, shiny apps before, it should look very familiar. There's sort of the control panel over on the left side, where in this case, there are four sliders that you can interactively move left and right. 
and then those cause changes in the plots and table over on the right. And so to walk you through uh, what the limiter does, um, so the, um, uh, th these uh, control panel on the left here, let me pull up this if I can. Here we go. So we have the control panel on the left where you can move the sliders those change these uh, with the location of these red dash lines and blue dash lines, as well as values in the table. Uh, these violin plots are distributions associated with the average survey biomass. And these were created uh, by assuming each one of the individual, three individual surveys that would comprise uh, that each year's estimate were followed a log normal distribution with the CV that comes from the uh, survey uh, design based estimate. And so you pull one value uh, from each of the three surveys, average them, and that becomes the first value. And then you go back and do pull a second value from each of the three, average them. That's your second value. Do that a thousand times. And then the violin plot simply shows the uh, distribution. Uh, it's like a density plot sort of turned on its side and mirrored so that the uh, wider parts show where more of the uh, observations are and thinner points show where there are fewer. Okay, so in terms of what the sliders do, uh, these limits are what the sort of the sideboards are, guardrails are, that are being decided uh, in terms of how much can the survey change. And uh, the idea would be that once you set these uh, guide bars, then the as long as the next survey point falls with between them, you would stick with whatever your constant quota is that you had decided uh, in advance. Uh, this next uh, controller uh, allows you to zoom in and see only years, say 2017 through 2020, or zoom out and see the series starting in 2010. And this allows you to uh, focus in on the area of interest. And uh, the plot scales automatically so that you can, as you zoom in, you can see more detail in the recent years. Uh, this uh, blue percent line uh, is related to these histograms. And what these histograms are, are simply the percentages of these distributions that are between the two red lines. So you can see that most of the distribution for this year is between these two lines, while very little of the distribution is between the two lines for this year. And this blue bar is just a, a guide to help your eye so that you can look at probability limits uh, such as 80, 90, 95, or 99%. And finally, the most important part is what is the constant quota? What is going to be the catch advice that you are going to to pick. And what this bottom table uh, does is to help um, the user see the consequences associated with the two limits. So wherever, if you're between, in this case, 600 or 5,000 metric tons, the quota would be 200 uh, metric tons. And this uh, final column just shows the exploitation rate ex associated with these two uh, boundary conditions. And so obviously, as the um, biomass gets higher, the exploitation rate goes higher because the exploitation rate is just the uh, quota uh, divided by the survey biomass. So there were some uh, caveats uh, associated with this. Um, basically, just like with uh, stocks, past performance does not ensure future benefits. 
um, meaning that this is not a mechanistic model. It has no ability to predict uh, what's going to happen in the future, and something unexpected could. Um, uh, when you don't have your survey information, this becomes a challenge, uh, as we saw. Uh, this is also true for the empirical approach. And the if there is a change in the survey catchability, it might require recalculation of quota and limits, which is also true for the empirical approach. But more importantly, why might this be a bad idea to go this route of trying to set a, a constant uh, quota between two uh, average survey biomass limits? Well, one reason might be that you could miss out on possible yield. Um, if this, the stock were to increase and you were still holding the quota constant, um, you're, there's the potential that, hey, we, we could have caught more and we're artificially preventing the fishery from doing so. Um, this doesn't seem to be a big issue at the moment as the catch is well below the quota. Uh, conversely, you could end up fishing too hard. You could set a quota that results in a very high exploitation rate if you maintain it down to very low stock sizes. Um, that's where this, uh, that table that showed the exploitation rate associated with the limits comes into play. by setting a maximum exploitation rate uh, that you want to consider, then that should uh, prevent <coughs> this uh, fishing too hard from happening. Uh, you still need to decide what happens if the biomass is outside the limits. And you also miss out on the joy that is negotiating the annual quotas. Um, however, perhaps that time saved could be used to work on other things. So based on some positive feedback after uh, first showing it in the 2020 track, um, I developed version two that was uh, examined in 2021. And so up in the top right, we have the same um, panel that we just went through. And now in the top left, there's a nice uh, welcome a uh, splash page that has a bit more, a bit of description about each one of the tabs uh, associated with the new version two. In the bottom left is a historical uh, tab that presents the catch and quota on the top, the surveys and the average survey biomass in the middle, and the exploitation rate in the bottom. And you have the, some ability to determine where those purple vertical lines are and the table then tells you what the mean are for each of the values within those time period. And this was to try to address the possibility of setting reference points uh, for the stock. And then most importantly, I think in the bottom right is shows the relationship between the quota and the average survey biomass on the left and the exploitation rate and the average survey biomass on the right. And what this shows is ha what happens when you hold the quota constant between the um, um, vertical red lines. It means the exploitation rate which follows an exponential decline between there. And then uh, what's shown here is the basically the same empirical approach outside those lines. And the it also provides a number of uh, ways of using this uh, tool to set, to pick appropriate values for the limits and the quota. So some of the questions that have to be answered are how to handle missing data, uh, what to set the upper and lower limits at, what to set the quota at, um, what to set the exploitation rate outside the limits and what's the maximum exploitation rate you're going to allow, whether to use a, the, the mean value uh, or point estimate from this, the three surveys or some percentile, uh, how quickly to respond, should you immediately respond if your uh, most recent average survey biomass falls outside the limits or should you wait a few years 
And finally, as I said, uh, potential for reference points. So the TMGC met before the track and like this approach, um, I'll note that the Miller et al. results were not available yet and didn't, we did not know they were coming at the time. And so what the TMGC did was use the percentiles of the distribution since 2014 and looked at both a 75% and 95% quasi risk of if what we've seen since 2014 is representative of what we think is okay, then we're going to choose either the 75th or 95th percentiles or choose limits that allow for all those years to have 75 or 95 percent of the distribution within uh, those boundaries. They also consider two maximum exploitation rates, one associated with the current FREF, which goes back to the, the VPA uh, years where um, it was derived from uh, F0.1 and F40% and happily came up with the same value uh, back when M was considered to be 0.2. And it also, they also considered setting F equal to M when M was, is allowed to be as high as 0.4. Um, these exploitation rates come out to be 20% in the first case or 27.5% in the second case. So these combinations of percentiles and max exploitation rates led to four options for the uh, quota uh, and the limits. So when the track met in uh, July, now we had the, the new uh, Miller et al. survey values. And based on what the TMGC had done and these new track values, the track recommended setting the, the constant quota, in essence, to be 200 metric tons, which, and that would be held as long as the um, uh, point estimate of future uh, average survey biomass coming from the three surveys was between the lower limit of 1,000 metric tons and the upper limit of somewhere between 7,300 and 8,500. And so the lower limit was associated with the 2018 um, lowest point that we've seen uh, under the new Miller et al values. And the upper limit was based on adjusting the range that came out of the TMGC uh, 75th and 95th percentiles to deal with the uh, maximum uh, upper limit. Uh, thankfully, uh, under both the adjusted and unadjusted survey biomass for 2021, they were both between these lower and upper survey limits, and therefore the uh, catch advice was um, uh, maintained for at 200 uh, metric tons. And the uh, track recommended a maximum exploitation rate of 20%, which can you can see is the 200 metric tons divided by uh, 1,000 metric tons at the lower limit. Um, one potential issue associated with this approach is that there can be some large changes as you cross these boundaries or limits. Uh, these are not generally desirable, um, uh, but there are a bunch of ways that they could be removed. So what I'm, what I'm talking about here is uh, these discontinuities here. When you cross this boundary, uh, the quota suddenly drops from 200 down to about 70 or increases from 200 up to about uh, 600 something. And similarly, the exploitation rate goes from 0.2 uh, 20 percent down to seven percent or up from two and a half percent to seven percent. Uh, these can be modified by just basically moving the connection point here and changing how your exploitation rate responds as you cross these boundaries and this makes for a smoother transition 
Uh, this is an area for future research um, if, in fact, this approach is uh, considered, continues to be considered uh, for use for management. So in terms of the limiter, uh, the pros are, again, it's, it's simple. All you're doing is computing the average survey biomass and seeing if it's between two numbers, the, those two limits. And so it's algorithmic. And the pro is that it provides stability of catch advice when the surveys are within the limits. Uh, the cons are that exploitation rate increases as biomass decreases to the lower limit. Uh, this is what we saw on uh, both the right-hand panels. Uh, this has caused some concern because from a conservation standpoint, this is exactly the opposite of what you would want to do. As the biomass decreases, you would want to uh, decrease uh, the catch or decrease the exploitation rate or at least hold it steady. Uh, but this is a mathematical uh, reality of holding quotas constant between uh, the two uh, limits. And there's still this <clears throat> maximum exploitation rate is required. So where are we currently? Well, the track has recommended uh, the limiter approach and TMGC is currently considering its adoption. The catch advice from the limiter was agreed through negotiations by the TMGC for one year. So for uh, 2022, that 200 metric tons is in fact the, the joint US-Canada quota. Will the limiter be used next year? This is to be determined. And there is a TMGC intercessional in early November where I'll be having some more discussions with the TMGC members about pros and cons and whether or not to continue with this approach. And one of the things that I'll be showing them is here a V3, uh, here's a little sneak peek, uh, showing the Miller uh, et al. values compared to the original values. Um, so to finish up, I'd like to just some of the lessons I've learned uh, through this. Uh, first, change is hard. Um, as been through a number of changes from VPA to empirical approach to now potentially limiter, um, it, it's hard to, to make these changes uh, programmatically and um, uh, institutionally. Um, however, uh, in my experience, these interactive visual, visual, visualizations are very helpful. Um, that having people have the ability to move the sliders around themselves and come to their own conclusions on their own time uh, really helped the, the discussions that we've had at both the TMGC and TRAC. The details are important. There's a lot that goes on under the hood of this apparently simple um, Shiny app and you wanna make sure you get those right. And finally, communication is really the key to all this. And so uh, in that vein, uh, please remember to keep track of all your presentations so you can pull a slide from a 2006 presentation you made and use it in a 2021 presentation sometime in the future. So with that, uh, if there's time, I'd be happy to take any questions. And thanks again, Gary, for inviting me to, to give this talk. Thanks, Chris.